All right, I'm I'm gonna be straight with you. I binged 60 some odd episodes of Attack on Titan, so I'm only making this video to justify my irresponsible behavior. Let's go. Anime has gone through a very interesting transition in the 21st century. There was a fair amount of time there where watching anime was synonymous with being a social reject. Which was a shame, because stories and storytelling techniques used within anime just couldn't be found frequently in Western media. But across the years, anime has moved out of the fringe and closer and closer towards the mainstream. Much of this shift in social perspective can be attributed to many landmark anime gaining popularity to the point of being unignorable. You know, One Piece, Dragon Ball Z, Pokemon, Naruto, Bleach, and everything that Miyazaki makes. And among those fictions that broke the glass ceiling for anime, at least in America, is Attack on Titan. When the show first dropped, it had hype pretty much unlike anything I had ever seen for anime. Everyone was talking about Attack on Titan, even people who I didn't think watched anime. Heck, there were serious car commercials featuring Attack on Titan. But then, as the years went on, and the episodes took longer and longer to come out, the hype died down a bit. However, the release of Season 4 has reinserted Attack on Titan into the national conversation. Perhaps not to the level of its peak, but definitely to the point of widespread excitement. And the run of the show has led up to the most recent episode as of the writing of this script, Declaration of War. Now, more likely than not, the next episode of Season 4, The Warhammer Titan, will already be out by the time I publish this video. But be that as it may, I did want to spend some time today focusing on Declaration of War, because as far as I'm concerned, it is one of the most well-executed and well-paced episodes in the entire series. Everything from the tension between Reiner and Eren to Willy's speech to the trap set for the Titans, all of it was just chef's kiss. And of course, to top it all off, was the chill-inducing climactic finish. But that cliffhanger ending, and really everything else before it, was only possible because of the subject of today's video. Pacing. Now, while all of my content is made with the express purpose of educating aspiring writers on the merits and execution of storytelling techniques, I do also think that if you're just a fan of Attack on Titan, the next 25 or so minutes will be a cool look behind the curtain to see how the show keeps you coming back for more, and how it creates some of its most intense and dramatic moments through pacing. But the thing to know about pacing and narratives is that it's really hard to get a grip on. Everyone talks about pacing when they critique fiction, but think about how much you actually know about pacing, let alone its proper execution. I think that realization is even harder for fans of anime to accept, because we are so used to the medium making us groan over poor pacing. Anime is kind of legendary for absolutely demolishing the pace of a plot. Dragon Ball Z's Frieza arc is probably the most famous example. I'm pretty sure 5 minutes in-universe is something like 2 hours of actual screen time. Other well-known anime will simply have entire episodes of screaming or grunting or crying. I think it's this very aspect that endears us to certain anime over others. There is immaculate pacing in anime like The Promised Neverland, My Hero Academia, Kakeguri, and yes, Attack on Titan. And it's not just anime, good pacing is alluring in fiction in general. Whether it be The Count of Monte Cristo, Avatar The Last Airbender, or Gone Girl, good pacing is good pacing. But pacing itself is just as varied as all those stories I mentioned, even by genre. If you are writing a drama or a psychological suspense, that is going to have a slower pacing than if you're writing an action-adventure. Horror has different pacing needs than romantic comedies. Real politic has different pacing needs than epic fantasy. And depending on how you mix and match these genres in your stories, the needs of pacing alter even further. But, but, okay, hold on. In saying all that, I think I've gotten a bit ahead of myself, because I have yet to explain what is pacing. 
Well, as difficult a subject as it might be, we're going to break it down, and we're going to use Attack on Titan to do it. Pacing isn't actually any one specific narrative technique. It is actually a term used for the execution of multiple different narrative techniques. But we are going to simplify things by creating two different categories, macro pacing and micro pacing. Now, since these two categories are so different from each other, we are actually going to use two different sections of Attack on Titan to learn about each of them. First will come the macro pacing, and to unpack that, we will actually be looking at the whole of Season 1. This will be a look at the large-scale planning of the narrative, hence macro. Then will come the micro pacing, where we will focus on the inner workings of Declaration of War specifically. This, of course, will be a look at the smaller, more intricate details, hence micro pacing. This will also allow us not only to learn about pacing as a whole, but dissect how Attack on Titan uses both methods of pacing and keeps us coming back for more. If you ever wanted an English class that substitutes Lord of the Flies for anime nonsense, sit back and relax because you've come to the right place. Now, the reason we start with macro pacing is because it's probably what you are most familiar with already. Macro pacing is the rate which story elements are introduced relative to each other. Basically, it is how quickly the plot progresses because of new, relevant information. For an example, think of how quickly the plot progressed in anime like Kill a Kill or Seven Deadly Sins. These shows rely on impactful revelations to happen multiple times an episode to keep we of the audience on our toes. Now compare that to Death Note, where two whole episodes could be spent simply walking down a sidewalk, plotting a kill. Macro pacing is all about the time spent moving your audience from one plot point to the next, but even that can be complexly intricate. When I originally wrote this breakdown, I was going to talk about how Attack on Titan frequently intentionally disaligns the in-universe passage of time from the audience's passage of time in order to foster the best narrative pace. I was going to talk about how the show consistently flashes back to revelations so they can be revealed at a time when the pacing gives them the most power. There were a bunch of intricate macro pacing techniques that I wanted to discuss, but ultimately I decided that one, none of you want to sit through a two hour video, and b, what we will be talking about is already complex enough. Let's get into the large scale plotting of a narrative and how macro pacing affects it. Generally, different sections of a story have different pacing needs. If you are writing in a traditional three-act structure, an introduction, for example, is going to demand a quicker pace, meaning a faster rate of narrative elements being delivered. Why? Because the introduction of a story is not only where you need to establish the setting and the characters, it's where you need to hook your audience with the most interesting piece of your fiction, hopefully your conflict. This means you are most likely going to be throwing a lot at your audience at once to make them invested early on. This will ensure that they continue with your fiction. Your midsection is more likely than not going to have a slower pace, because now that your audience is invested, you could take some time to have them stew with the implications of a particular story element before bringing them to the next one. Of course though, as the midsection continues, pacing generally builds. This is what creates the well-known term, rising action. And lastly, the climax is a brief moment where the pace reaches its crescendo, creating the most tension-filled, quickly progressing part of the story. Sometimes there is even an extreme dipping of the pace just before the climax, a calm before the storm, a valley meant to accentuate the climax's peak. And lucky for us, Attack on Titan Season 1 is a great example of everything I just mentioned. The first half of Season 1 really works as a high-paced introduction. In 13 episodes, we cover 5 years, including the Breach of Walmaria, the introduction of the Titans, the in-universe discovery of the Colossal Titan and the Armored Titan, the destruction of Shiganshina, the death of Eren's mother, the disappearance of Eren's father, the recruitment into the military, graduating from the military, the attack on Trost, Eren becoming a Titan, and the resecuring of the Wall. All of that in 13 episodes. And honestly, I probably skipped over a bunch of consequential events too. 
The point though is to recognize the high rate at which story elements were introduced relative to one another in order to quickly invest a new audience in the setting, characters, and conflict. The next act we have is the midsection, and as expected, there is an immediate and noticeable dip in the pacing. Episodes 14 and on see us in the aftermath of the narrative elements that were established in the intro, and allow us to focus on the consequences and adaptations the characters must endure because of them. These slower paced moments are much more focused on the characters and the cerebral elements of the plot. But as I said, the midsection is not completely low pace. It is meant to build the pace to have rising action. And yet again, this is exactly what happens in Attack on Titan. When the scout regiment assumes their formation and they find the female Titan, we get greater and greater tension throughout this series of episodes. Where this section of the narrative started out slow and methodical, now it is high octane with both the characters and audience seeing progressive story elements moment by moment. This all then naturally leads to the climax, a brief moment with high pacing. Just before it though is that calm before the storm that I mentioned, a slow episode that focuses on Annie just before the pacing ramps up to the next episode to showcase her pivotal fight with Eren. And in this brief climax, the story drastically evolves. The inner city of the walls is destroyed, Eren has this fiery titan form, Annie shields herself in crystal, and the wall is revealed to be comprised of titans. For the most part, Attack on Titan Season 1 was a textbook example of macro pacing in storytelling, which is probably why it captivated such a wide audience. But Attack on Titan wouldn't be in the upper echelon of well-paced anime if it did everything by the book. No, it takes some chances with the pacing. Specifically, let's look back at that introduction again. Remember how I said this section was comprised of 13 episodes that worked to establish the setting, the characters, and the conflict? Well, I lied. Kinda. Something quite cool and pretty unique is that there are actually two introductions in the show. The first is from episodes 1 to 4. Like I said, these initial episodes set up everything that we as the audience expect. We have the setting, our antagonists, but most importantly, our protagonist, Eren. And if there is one thing that an introduction is meant to do, it's to thrust us into the beginning of a story. Which means that an introduction must have an inciting incident. And you probably guessed it already, it's this. Eren's mother is what spurs him on to join the military and what puts his story into action. These first four episodes specifically are what take place across five years, meaning the pacing of all this delivered information is quite quick. And just from having edited so many stories, I think I have a good idea about why so much information and internal time was crammed into these first four episodes. Think back to how I said an introduction needs to deliver a story's most interesting narrative elements in order to invest a new audience. And remember how we discussed that the introduction really works as the setup for everything else to come in the story? Well, considering those two things brings us to an interesting conclusion. Episodes 1 through 4 are a fake-out introduction. Or really, they're an intro for the intro. Now, I know that might seem confusing right now, but a consideration of pacing might make this more clear. Episodes 1 through 4 focus highly on the experience of Eren Jaeger, almost exclusively. The major story elements that are introduced to the audience all frame Attack on Titan as Eren's story. His father had a secret. His mother died. Mikasa and Armin are devoted to him. He had the greatest struggle during training. Everything in the story pretty much revolved around Eren. We are led to believe that the conflict of the narrative will be Eren working to join the scouts and finding a way to destroy all the titans. Why'd I join? I decided I have to kill them. I won't stop till every single titan is dead and rotting. Dead. Every last one. But that's not what the show is about at all. Episode 5 through 13 are the real introduction for the show because they bring in the real inciting incident and the real conflict. 
Eren's ability to transform into a titan is what kickstarts all of the major events of the narrative. It pushes literally everything into action, which by definition makes it the inciting incident. But keep in mind, this is not Eren's inciting incident, this is the show's inciting incident. Eren was spurred into action because of the death of his mother, that is pretty plain to see. But the show from episode 5 and on does not focus on Eren exclusively anymore. The conflict of the narrative is humanity's struggle for survival against the titans, all framed through the experiences of the military. That is why episodes 5 through 13, as the true introduction, focuses so much more on the experience of these multiple different characters. That stays consistent as the show progresses too, because while Eren is definitely more important than the other characters, he is nowhere near the singular focus. But to properly appreciate episodes 5 through 13, or to even know what the heck is going on, there needed to be build-up. Could you imagine how confusing it would have been to start here as episode 1? Or how much less impactful Eren's death would be if we only got to spend one episode with him? What the show chose to do instead was basically create an intro for the intro. And the only reason they pulled it off was because of how they paced it. Attack on Titan's first four episodes are incredibly fast paced when you consider the five years that they cover. The initial episode's pacing becomes even more pronounced when you realize the next nine episodes cover a single day. The first four episodes had us on an ultra-fast diet of information, basically focusing on Eren's experience as a crash course to the world. Instead of lingering on for half a season, the show spent just enough time educating us on what to expect, while also speeding us through to the grand narrative events that occurred during the Trost attack. There isn't a doubt in my mind that if Eren's transformation into a Titan had come in episode 18 instead of episode 8, the show would have been far less well received. But that misstep was avoided because of the quick macro pacing decisions the show used in its opening episodes to ferry us to the true hooks of the narrative. That is not to say everything was perfect though. There are strengths and weaknesses to every narrative technique, pacing included. By being so speedy with the opening and then focusing so broadly on multiple characters and struggles, some watchers came away from season 1 feeling like the characters weren't developed. Perhaps by spending more time with Eren and the other recruits before the 9 episode High Octane Trost arc, those watchers could have become more endeared to the characters. But of course, in doing that, the pacing slows down significantly. This is why pacing as a whole is so subjective and so difficult. Each person consuming a fiction has a different idea and expectation of how the pacing should be. But really, at the end of the day, that all comes down to the personal decisions of the writer. The main thing to keep aware of is that when creating your own plots, whether they be outlines or fully fledged stories, always be mindful of the different acts of your narrative, what pacing needs work best within them, and when you might need to speed through or linger on certain events for the betterment of your story. But macro pacing isn't the only thing to consider. Now we move on to micro pacing and how Season 4 Episode 5 Declaration of War gives an example of how to utilize it to great effect. Micro pacing is the timing of when and how long story elements are revealed. Now, that might seem a bit more ambiguous than macro pacing, and that's because micro pacing is much more fluid and versatile of a technique, and honestly, one that can be explained much quicker. To use the pacing of Declaration of War as an example, the ending was Eren's transformation into a titan to disrupt Willy's speech. Now, as freaking awesome as that moment was, it was not placed there by accident. Eren's transformation was planned to coincide with the climax of Willy's speech, which then both acted as the climax of the episode. As Willy hit a crescendo, so did Eren's actions, and therefore, the episode. But getting these character moments to line up timing-wise takes a fair amount of micro-pacing. This means considering if you want the big climax of two characters to come at minute 22, you need to have 21 minutes of content to happen before that. So what exactly do you fill that time with? 
Well, the best writers recognize that to have a truly powerful climax, you need a good lead up. This means using every opportunity you have to build up a tone and tenor for the fiction that best fosters the power of the climax. For Declaration of War, the climax was built around Aaron taking the Marleans by surprise, appearing from under their nose to completely undermine their grand gathering. Since that is the goal for the finale, all the content preceding it should work to build up that tone of unease and vulnerability for the Marleans. Remember, all of the events detailed across this 22 minute episode didn't have to be this way. Based off content alone, this entire episode could really have been condensed down to 10 minutes. Think about it. Declaration of War is really just some characters talking and walking. Attack on Titan has covered whole years in single episodes, so the speedy option is very much there. But instead of going that route, the writers realized that a better narrative option would be to keep the audience in this moment, to really make us feel the tension of expecting something horrifically wrong to come from the Marleans. Eren has been the helpless manzel in distress for so long that seeing him here now, physically changed, emotionally reserved, intimidating, almost like an antagonist, a villain, was a narrative moment that had to be capitalized on. The first thing the episode did to achieve this goal was to introduce a tone of judgment and retribution through Reiner's perspective. With Aaron in front of him, Reiner realizes that he will have to answer for the things he did in the past and that there might be significant consequences. And again, instead of simply having this be a short conversation, the micro-pacing decision was to underlay it throughout the entirety of the episode to keep the feel of expectant judgment consistent. And this is a great decision because Willie's speech, while only being 7 minutes of screen time, is also paced to occur throughout the entire 22 minute episode. By itself, the speech might feel like an uplifting revelation about the Marleans past, but when paced against and alongside Reiner's conversation with Aaron, it's undercut by this constant feel of unease. But as great as these two dichotomous elements are, they aren't enough to make up a whole episode or craft the necessary tension on their own. That comes from the third POV that is consistent throughout the episode, the military. Early on, we get a look at scouts on edge, keeping a watchful eye for any danger that might rear its head. All things considered, that's pretty normal for the situation. But then that opens the door for the military's heightening tension. Peek and Porco are led away by a mysterious guard, and Peek, and by extension the audience, definitely feels like something is wrong. Likewise, the scouts continue to be on edge, looking for even the smallest sign of a threat. And it's right here, almost directly at the halfway point, that everything in the episode changes. The mysterious soldier leads Porco and Peek directly into a trap, and moments later, Willie reveals that the commonly known Marley in history is a lie. These events were timed to happen consecutively through micro-pacing. They worked together to progress the tone of unease and judgment even further than it was before. Now we know that the Marleans are definitely in danger in being acted against, and that history as taught has been a lie. Both Willie and the military POV execute a narrative twist. And then that allows an organic transition into Reiner's and Aaron's POV twist. Falco learns that he has been manipulated into sending messages to the enemy, which explains so much of what we've seen prior. This then leads into the crescendo of Reiner's POV, where his actions directly mirror the tone of the scene. He literally gets on his knees and asks for judgment. Finally, this allows the pacing of Willie's speech to crescendo as well, which then meets with Aaron's climactic transformation. This episode was a balancing act of multiple different POVs and narrative moments that needed to be synced up. But through micro-pacing, the show was able to expand and contract as need be. And some of the best and most crucial micro-pacing happens in ways that you might not even notice. Having the crowd react for 3 seconds here and 2 seconds there. Showing a conversation for 10 seconds. Even the length of the sentences in Willie's speech and the focus being placed on the actors. All these tiny things combine to become minutes worth of content, making it easier to properly place the climactic actions right at the end where they are best suited. 
These little moments are filler that also work organically to fit the tone of the narrative. As I said before, micro pacing is a very fluid and versatile narrative technique and is really only limited by your imagination as a writer. And while I couldn't go over every single facet of pacing, I hope this introduction to micro pacing and macro pacing through the lens of Attack on Titan has helped at least some of you come away a bit more confident in this very tricky subject. Pacing can truly make or break a fiction, so knowing how quickly to progress from one plot element to the next, and even when to introduce those plot elements, can really take your work to the next level. Anyway, thank you all for watching to the end. If you like what you heard, like, comment, and subscribe. If you really want to help out, support the channel on Patreon, or check out my novel on my personal website. Links will be in the description. As always, it was a pleasure, and I will talk to you all again soon.